Hi, this is Val Curtis, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Friday Harbor Live, where our brilliant and talented islanders are sharing their skills and stories with island kids of all ages. We wanna thank the Family Resource Center and the Community Foundation for sponsoring this episode. And we want you to know that we are still looking for guests. We have an incredible lineup this week, next week, but you know, and actually even part of the next week after that, but we are still looking for brilliant voices to bring forward to teach our island kids. Today, we have a really special guest. I was kind of starstruck to tell you the truth um, with our guest today. Um, she is Dr. Deborah Giles, also known as Giles, and she shares what poop can tell us about the health of endangered whales. Today, you're gonna to learn about our local resident orcas and her Disney star, yep, that's right, her Disney star poop sniffing dog, Eba. <laughs> she works at the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology with the Conservation Canines Program. And she also works at the University of Washington Friday Harbor Labs. Um, She's also, she's a very busy lady. She's also involved in working with Wild Orca, where you can find out more about Eba, the whale dog. And so something to know um, about, oh, I see we have a special guest that just popped in. I'm so excited. So um, she is going to share some information with us today. We have so much to learn and we are terribly grateful that her and her special guest give you one little guess who it might be. Um, it's here with us today. You're gonna find out. Here we go, three, two, one. <gasps> Hi, Giles. <laughs> Hi, Val. Thanks for having me. Of course, and who do we have there? That's Eva. She just got up from a nap uh, on the couch, and uh, so she's a little sleepy. Uh, yeah, this is Eva the whale dog. Um, Especially trained last year to find uh, not just southern resident killer whale feces, but other uh, whale poop also. So we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Fantastic. Well, I kind of gave a little hint of who you work with. You work with a lot of different places. Yeah. <laughs> and Eva's really busy. Um, but I will go ahead and hand it over to you so you can talk to our fabulous calendar. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This is super fun. Um, and I have to say, I don't know why the uh, my camera is black and white and actually reverse. For example, I have a black shirt on, interestingly, um, and it's showing up as white. Um, I, we, Val and I tried to fix it, but, but we have no idea what's going on. So um, we'll just pretend like this was <clears throat> back in the olden time. Um, so, uh, as I, uh, was introduced, thank you so much for that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to something else I am involved with and, uh, Islanders are strongly encouraged to get involved in this. Um, we do, uh, the San Juan Island naturalist program, uh, where we train naturalists to go and be essentially docents on the West side of San Juan at the land bank West side preserve. Um, we're partnering with folks and the um, state park at Lime Kiln. So we'll have people stationed out there and then um, at the county park, if we can get enough people um, involved and trained up, um, we'd love to be able to work with you. Um, having people out and being able to talk about our amazing landscape here, um, do a little bit of uh, endangered species, uh, um, pardon me, invasive species mitigation. Um, at different sites, like cutting out blackberries, things like that. Um, it's just all of us pitching in together to make the island um, uh, safe and interesting uh, for ourselves, for those of us that are cruising around and um, taking time out from our busy lives, and also anybody that might be visiting the island. So the San Juan Island Naturalist Program, uh, you can learn more about that. We have a Facebook page. Um, so I guess I'll start with uh, just talking about how absolutely um, insanely lucky we are in Washington state to have um, at least the opportunity uh, to see three different ecotypes of killer whales. So it's not super common to see the third one that uh, doesn't get a lot of attention, but um, we do have um, 
uh, on the outer coast, a group of trans, uh, a group of uh, whales called offshore killer whales. And those guys are, um, have been well known to be shark eaters um, in the past. And we know that because some of them have washed up and uh, the examination of their teeth, an examination of a dead animal is called uh, a necropsy um, as opposed to a human autopsy. So a necropsy um, has shown that these uh, offshore killer whales eat sharks. They, and we know that because their teeth are ground down because of the, the abrasive skin of a, an elasmobranch, which is what a shark is, like rays, uh, manta rays and things like that also have that kind of skin. Um, we did find out from uh, researchers uh, a couple of years ago that uh, did document offshore killer whales eating uh, fish in the presence of fish eating killer whales. So that was actually kind of new and interesting data. Um, the other two ecotypes that we have of killer whales are the mammal eating killer whales, um, formerly really well known as transients. Um, because they weren't known to hang out here or come back with any regularity in the past. Um, and those guys are well known uh, and can be seen uh, uh, performing lots of different acrobatics like throwing seals or seal, sea lions, <clears throat> porpoises out of the air. Um, and uh, generally just not, not traveling in huge groups, but um, uh, distinctly beautiful, amazing black and white animals that, that we can see in our waters here. Um, the most well-known for sure are the so-called Southern resident killer whales. And I say so-called because they're not so resident anymore. So these are the fish eaters that preferentially eat Chinook salmon. Um, they're uh, obligate fish eaters. They're, they've never been documented eating anything besides fish. And out of the fish that they eat, they absolutely preferentially eat Chinook salmon, um, the biggest, fattiest fish that are out there. So those guys are no dummies. They're going to eat the, that fish. Um, honey, I'm going to put you down. Oh, she's a little heavy. Um, so... <clears throat> Our resident fish eating killer whales are um, highly, highly endangered. Uh, these guys are uh, threatened from multiple different uh, fronts. Um, the three main identified threat. Well, let me go back. I want to take one quick step back and just say that um, killer whales worldwide are all considered one species, much like humans are all homo sapiens. Killer whales are all considered Orsinus orca. And when I was talking a minute ago about ecotypes, that's a way that scientists can break down different populations of killer whales that occur at different, in different areas around the world. And when I said that we're really lucky in Washington to have access to um, three, um, that's unique. Most, most places, killer whales do occur worldwide, but most places around the world only get um, one of, that, of those ecotypes. Um, the southern resident killer whales are down to only 72 animals, which is an incredibly small number of animals for a population. Uh, when the whales were listed on the endangered species list in 2005, there were 88 individuals. And so now that we're down to 72, we're absolutely going the wrong way as far as the population is concerned. Um, so when the whales were listed on the endangered species list, there were multiple threats that were identified, but the three main identified threats were lack of quality, quality and quantity of salmon, specifically Chinook. Um, the presence and uh, just the physical presence and the no noise associated with vessels of all types. And we now know that the large shipping con uh, container ships that go back and forth um, out of our waters, out Haro Strait and out the uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca, those guys put out the most, um, I would say egregious, the most potentially harmful noise uh, that's impacting the Southern residents. Um, but we've also got a tremendous number of different types of boats that occur in and around the, these Washington waters. So um, though that was a second identified threat. So the physical presence and associated noise with vessels and then toxicants of all kinds. So toxicants are man-made chemicals, whereas toxins are uh, um, poisons that are made by plants or animals. So when I say toxicants, that's what I mean. So human caused um, chemicals that are in, a, in our environment. And the, the sad fact is, is that what's plaguing the Southern residents is, a, is this terrible 
negative kind of feedback loop where all of those things are working together to um, uh, make the, the whale situation more dire than it would be if it was just one of those threats. Um, we know from the mammal eating killer whales that occur in this water that um, food is the most important threat. The lack of food for the Southern residents is the most important threat that we really should be paying attention to. And the reason I say that is because um, when the whales are getting enough to eat, um, the toxins, toxicants that are um, built up in the uh, food chain that end up in the apex predator that is the Southern resident killer whale, um, those toxins will stay locked up in the fat as long as the whales are getting enough to eat every day. When the whales go through periods of, of, of famine where they're not getting to eat for a day or more, uh, probably sometimes a lot longer than that, they naturally, our, our mammalian body naturally starts to um, metabolize some of our fat stores. And that's when those toxins that have, toxicants that have been locked up in the blubber get released into the system. And we know from people that are um, going through detox diets, um, also uh, other um, research that's happened where um, animals are going through a detox situation. We know that detoxing makes people um, feel lethargic. You can't think straight. And we know from a biological perspective that it makes our bodies more um, susceptible to disease. And the same thing is happening with the Southern resident killer whales. Um, all of that was kind of like a really sad and um, um, depressing way, I guess, to start this talk. I don't want to um, dwell on that as much. Um, I would like to talk about the ways that scientists are studying these whales um, and also members of the public. There are ways that the public can get involved in helping to document what's going on with these animals. Um, because that gives hope that it's it's through the science that um, we can find hope and find ways to, um, I guess, rectify or, or um, uh, fix some of the problems that we humans have have uh, uh, caused in the in the marine environment and in the terrestrial realm. So one of the ways that um, that we study killer whales um, is by <clears throat> there's lots of different ways. But one of the ways that I'm, I'm most uh, involved with is by looking at fecal samples. So poop samples, uh, the name of this talk, um, uh, I had Val put it up as uh, Everybody Loves a Pooping Whale. That was actually a bumper sticker that we made a couple of years ago. And it's, it's kind of a funny, um, funny phrase, but when you think about it, it actually makes sense because if you have a pooping whale, it means that you have a whale that's A, alive, and B, that's well enough fed to be pooping. And that's what we want to have with the Southern residents. So poop tells us a tremendous amount of what's going on in the internal body of an animal. And um, so I got involved with a program um, at the University of Washington, the Center for Conservation Biology, under the direct, uh, direction of Dr. Sam Wasser, who pioneered the use of scab detection dogs in 1997. And um, so people have been using dogs for you know, years and years and years to um, to find things that we humans are having a hard time finding, like buried people under snow. So there's specially trained um, avalanche dogs. Um, there are dogs that are trained to sniff out drugs. There's do really dogs. Now we know dogs can be trained to sniff out COVID, uh, which is just phenomenal. We've got right here on San Juan Island an amazing program where dogs are trained to sniff Parkinson's disease, even years before the person shows any signs of having Parkinson's disease. So dogs really are a uh, man, human's best friend. And um, so Sam took that concept and put it to work for conservation. And um, that was a really great move because it meant that we were able to collect samples from endangered species without ever having to get near them. Um, and in some cases, uh, not even in the same time at the same place. So for example, dogs can find a, a frozen wolf scat, a wolf poop or a caribou poop in many, many, many feet of snow. So months after the animal has left the area, um, dogs can find that fecal sample. Um, with whales, uh, we can find samples, you know, the, the marine realm is a very different situation because you've got the, uh, the wind moving uh, the sample across the top of the water. 
You have uh, also wind that are causing uh, different types of waves sometimes. Um, you also have tides and currents that are changing water uh, movement. And so it's, it's a, a bit of a dynamic situation to, to work in, but the dogs can learn how to tell us their handlers, and in our case, the boat driver, um, where that sample is. And so um, the idea behind this is, is that we're able to collect samples from these endangered southern resident killer whales without getting anywhere near them, which is really a good thing because we need to be able to give them space um, and give them um, uh, just some as, as much space as possible so that they can live their lives. So right now the laws require vessels to stay 300 meters away from the from whales, boats, sorry, boats staying 300 meters away from the sides of the whales and then 400 meters in the front and back. And with our dog, we can stay um, up to a mile away from the back, back of the whale, um, which is pretty fantastic. And if it's a really nice, fatty, rich sample, meaning that the whales are getting enough to eat and they're pooping big patties, big pancakes of, of, um, of, uh, of samples for us, um, those can stay on the water for a long time, 10, 20, even 30 minutes. I think the longest we ever had was 45 minutes where the whales, um, one of the whales uh, pooped in active pass. And we know that it was 45 minutes later because we knew when they exited the, the far end of, of active pass. And we were very far, far behind, 45 minutes behind. And yet our dog Tucker at the time was able to find this sample. So that was really fantastic. Um, Again, once we collect that, non-invasively collect that sample, we can look at tremendous numbers of, of variables to try and determine health, uh, the health of the whales. So for example, one of the main things that we're focusing on right now are pregnant females. So there are a lot of females in the Southern resident population that are getting pregnant, um, but up to 69% of them that we have, that we have samples from um, up to 69% of these females are losing their baby um, to miscarriages before the baby can be born alive. And what we're finding that's going along with that is, is that the moms are food deprived. Um, those females that are not getting enough to eat, they're circulating their toxins. Um, there's a lot of different things going on, but the, but the um, result is, is that these females are losing their babies. Um, too soon, too, too early for uh, the baby's not developed enough. And so when you have a population of animals that's already struggling with, with numbers, um, again, we just have 72 individuals. Um, every single miscarriage, every single lost baby is, is, a, is a huge loss to the, to the population. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to look at is um, determining are those pregnancy failures changing over time? Are more and more females losing their babies? Or has this been, uh, you know, over the course of our study, we've been, this is our 11th year, uh, actually, no, sorry, the 13th year, it's my 11th year. Um, we're trying to look back at, at older samples to see if that, that was the case before. My guess, my hypothesis is that, um, that females were not losing their babies as, as much before. And so that's a huge, that, that has huge implications for management decisions. If the females that are losing their babies are losing them because they're not getting enough to eat, then that's going to have management um, implications for fish, fish uh, related to fish management. And so um, some of the other things that we can look at with uh, feces is um, whether or not the whales are getting enough to eat. Um, we can look at whether or not the, the how much toxicants are, are circulating through their system. Um, we can look at things like bacteria and uh, microplastics. Um, Val's just showing right now a picture of us last year. That's uh, Dr. Sam Wasser there um, leaning down. He's uh, processing, um, he's actually processing a sample from a humpback whale. And that's my colleague, Sadie Youngstrom. Um, helping with that. And then you can see me in the background. I've got that 50 mil tube that I'm holding up. Um, and that we got about 10 of those. So the difference between a humpback whale feces and a killer whale feces, southern resident killer whale feces, is sometimes, like I said, that's a 50 mil tube. Sometimes we don't even get a half a mil 
of, of uh, Southern resident killer whale poop. And so the reason for that, when we get those small samples, it may be because it's sinking, but more often than not, it's because the whales just are not pooping very much. And uh, when you don't get enough to eat, you just don't have enough, your body doesn't give up any of your food. And so, um, yeah, like I was saying, we can look at gut biome, we can look at microplastics, pretty much anything you can imagine, um, we can tell from just, uh, if we have a decent sized fecal sample, we can look at all of that. Um, and so I'm very, feel very lucky to be able to be a part of this project with the Center for Conservation Biology, because I really feel that we're giving science um, and uh, giving science into the hands of policymakers in order to try and recover this population. I want to just say one thing about that. You know, I, I, I get asked not infrequently, um, you know, why bother? Why spend so much time trying to recover a population of animals when, you know, extinctions occur naturally all the time? Um, and my answer to that is, is that the difference with this population is, is that number one, as another killer whale researcher said, Alexandra Morton said, if we lose this population, if this population of whales goes extinct, it will be the first time ever that we've actually lost a population where every single individual was known. Every single individual has a name. We know their family. And if we lose them, we're losing a, a culture of, of, of beings that were here before we were. And in a very, very short amount of time, um, the, we, we have, we've done a lot of things that have, have negatively impacted the whale's environment and therefore the whales themselves. And so the reason to recover these animals is because they are they are uh, they are like a tribe. They're they're they were the original harvesters of Pacific salmon. They co-evolved with salmon um, that were a hundred pounds. Imagine that having a, a hundred plus pound salmon. That's why these whales um, evolved over time to just be salmon eaters because salmon used to be amazing. Uh, amazing animals. And now, you know, we're lucky if we see a 12 pound salmon or even a 10 pound salmon. And so these whales um, have culture. They have uh, unique, very, very unique family bonds. Uh, in most cases, males and females, brothers and sisters stay with their mom their entire life. Um, and while we've all been cooped up in uh, this COVID shutdown, maybe the idea of staying with your parents for your whole life is uh, not the most lovely idea on the planet and vice versa. Um, in the animal world, I just think it's a really unique and beautiful thing um, that these animals are so socially bonded that they stay in very close contact, basically within calling range of their mom her entire life. And then when she dies, uh, the brothers uh, go with their sister. And so the family stay together. And, um, you know, these, these whales, uh, these J and K and L pods, which make up the, the, um, the entirety of the Southern resident killer whale clan, these guys are unique and special and, um, everything that is, is impacting them is our fault, you know, for lack of a more diplomatic way of saying it, um, it's our fault that they're struggling as much as they are. And so it's our responsibility to recover this population of animals. So um, Val, I don't know, um, I actually forgot to ask you how much time we have, but I don't know if there are any questions or if you have any questions or if there's other things that you think I should um, cover. I'm coming in here, I know. Um, <laughs> so I am just sitting here listening to you and learning and enjoying it. So <laughs> and um, yeah, so people who are watching along, we have a few right now. and. So if you do have questions for Giles, just let us know and we can get those questions to her. Um, when, so you mentioned, how long has Eva been with the program? Eva got trained last June. June 24th was her first day in training. And we had about a week with our uh, lead handlers, Cami Roth and Julianne Ubagai came up to the island from Pack Forest. Our, our kennel is on um, at the base of Mount Rainier. So that's part of the University of Washington. And those two amazing women came up and worked with me for about a week, training Eva on land, which is how we train the dogs. 
And then um, Sam was able to come up for Eva's first days on the water, which was so cool. Um, and uh, we were out there on June 5th. Uh, for the first time. And we did find three samples that day. And um, one of the ways that you train the dog is you pair that smell that you want to train them on with their ball. And so we uh, we did a different focal, it's called focal follow. So we went about 200 meters behind the whales, just scanning in the water with Eva on the front of the boat, but us just looking in the water. And we found three that day. And uh, every time we found one, we would give her the ball and let her play like a crazy person, crazy dog. Um, and but the next day, J July 6th, was her second day with wild whales, and she found her first sample. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, we were really impressed. So how was Eva chosen? Well, she actually was my, my companion dog. She was just our, our family dog. And uh, it was, it's kind of a long story, but the, the upshot of it is, is that our handler and dog from the previous two years, Colette Yi and Dio and Jack, but Dio for the previous year, they went on to a different study because we weren't entirely sure uh, we could get the study on the water. We were lacking funds at the beginning of last year. Um, amazingly, you know, people look at this project and, and must think that we're really well funded because it's such a cool project using in most cases, rescued dogs, taught to save endangered species, and it's killer whales. And it's like, you know, amazing. You'd think that it would just be a, a hugely well-funded project, but it's quite frankly not. Um, and so Colette and, um, and Dio went on to a different study. And um, so when we got funding, which was phenomenal, we got amazing funding from the Vulcan uh, Corporate, uh, Vulcan Inc. Um, which is the um, philanthropic, one of the philanthropic arms for um, Paul Allen's foundation. Um, so Vulcan provided uh, funding for us last year. And suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, we don't have a handler and a, and a dog. And I had actually been hired in 2009 for the program um, to be the vessel driver. And uh, that I had remembered uh, our former uh, trainer, dog trainer, Heath Smith, now of rogue detection, um, he met Eva and he and I were trying to talk about the whale study and Eva kept shoving her toy into his, in his hand, trying to get him to play with her. And at one point he looked down and he was like, do you, have you ever thought about training her to be a scat dog? And I was like, no, but I'd like to. And so he took her toy, which was a, a braided rope and kind of put it in his armpits and in his hair. And I was just like, okay. And he chucked it into this waist high grass. And without even a second a hesitation, Eva just leapt into the air and into this grass. And he was like, yeah, you could train her. And so that was kind of in the back of my head going into 20, that was in 2018. And so going into 2019, when we needed a dog and handler, I asked Sam if he would be willing to let me try and, and uh, get uh, the, the professional trainers, Tammy and Julianne, up here to train Eva. And he said, yeah, let's go ahead and try it, but don't get your hopes up. Cause it's, you know, hard to have a companion animal that doesn't cut the mustard sort of thing, or if that's the right phrase, mustard, <laughs> whatever. Um, and so I said, okay, I won't get my hopes up, but he saw, I mean, she's just phenomenal. Yeah, so she's super out. sweet dog, super sweet dog. I'm gonna just show another little picture of her here. And she recently had kind of a big deal thing happen for her. There she is. <laughs> yeah. So can you tell us about that? That she recently had a little um, starstruck yeah. moment. Yeah, so in October, amazingly, we had um, a film crew from uh, Disney, Disney Plus come up. And uh, I did not expect to see Killer Wells. Um, but they came up and they filmed with us because uh, they were starting a new program called It's a Dog's Life. And it's kind of a fun program. The guy that developed it was, um, his name is Jim Farmer. And he and his wife had this idea that they want, oh, I didn't tell you. So Jim Farmer is has been the voice of um, Pluto and Goofy with Disney, with Disney for the last 34 years. And so uh, Jim and his wife had this idea that they wanted to get Jim out from behind the camera 
and uh, um, allow him to do interviews with dogs. Yeah, so there's the, the awesome pro promo for the program. And so they came up in October and, uh, and we were able to get out on the water. And uh, actually they said that they were Southern residents in the, in the show. I think they just uh, accidentally got that wrong or whatever. Um, it was actually transients. Thankfully we ended up having some whales to go out on. But Eba has been trained on some uh, fecal samples from the mammal eating killer whales. Um, we haven't found any of those ourselves yet, but we did get some samples from our colleagues at NOAA who were kind enough to give us uh, small samples of the some of the mammal eating killer whale uh, samples that they had collected over time. And so we have trained Eba on those, but um, as my our colleagues, uh, Brad and Candy at NOAA say, um, all you have to do is put in a tremendous amount of time and you might get a, a mammal eating killer whale feces. Um, it took them, uh, I think their average is 80 hours per sample. Whereas if the Southern resident fish eating killer whales are getting enough to eat, they poop up a storm. Um, so uh, anyway, we were able to go out uh, to the uh, south part, south end of uh, Vancouver Island and uh, get with some transient whales last year in October. And they did that great, uh, great show. So if you have Disney Plus, um, she's actually the very, very first um, dog that they profile on that new program called It's a Dog's Life. So it was really exciting. And we yeah. had a chance to watch it in our house. It was really fun. It was really um, fun. And I was thinking, and we talked about this a little bit before, that the first thing that hit my head was like, oh my gosh, they got a really nice day <laughs> on the water. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it looked really nice. It was sunny, but oh my goodness, it was cold. You can see under her float coat, under her life vest, um, give a shout out to Rough Wear there. They've, uh, they always contribute all of our uh, safety gear, safety harnesses for our dog work. And um, so they've, she's got a Rough, uh, rough Wear jacket um, underneath her Rough Wear float coat. So yeah, it was cold that day, but at least we got with whales and the film crew were just absolutely beside themselves as we all are when we get to see killer whales in the wild. Yeah, it must be hard trying to focus on like doing your job as a, doing the film crew and the wonderment of getting to see the orcas for the first time for them. That was yeah. something. And so another question that I had for you was about conservation canines mm -hmm. and kind of what is some of the work that that group is doing? Yeah. So Sam started Conservation Canines um, again back, uh, uh, you know, he pioneered the use of, of scent dogs um, uh, back in 97 and then developed the uh, Conservation Canines through the department, the uh, biology department, and then the um, Center for Conservation Biology. And um, gosh, uh, this program has done some of the most cutting edge uh, work on using scent dogs for conservation around the world. So everything from um, uh, wolves, caribou, um, uh, uh, what are they, uh, arboreal, invasive arboreal iguanas, um, snake species, big cats um, all over Asia, um, uh, work's been done in Africa. Some of the most um, fantastic work is um, going on with elephants now. Um, of course, the killer whale work is probably one of the more high profile ones because the, the Southern residents are amazing. And also because they're endangered, they're listed on the endangered species list. And so it gets a lot of attention. Um, one of the coolest um, studies, if we have time to talk about it, was Sam, um, you know, so in Northern California, the Northern Spotted Owl, um, has been over the decades a highly controversial uh, animal um, listed on the endangered species list. They are um, very, very imperiled. These are animals that are have to have to um, nest um, in old growth forests. They are um, require. It's a requirement of their habitat to have old growth forest. And um, there was a period of time, um, you know, thirty to uh, kind of twenty five years ago. Um, 24 years ago, um, where the um, spotted owls were in some of the um, last of the old growth forests that occur in, in Northern California. 
And there was a, a, a moratorium on logging that occurred um, that said that um, the spotted owl habitat could be protected as long as scientists could document the, the um, presence of the spotted owls. Well, what happened is, is that, and we're seeing it here now too in Washington state, where barred owls, which are uh, in, in the past had not been uh, known west of the Rockies, um, barred owls, which are a more aggressive owl, started taking over habitat, uh, spotted owl habitat in Northern California. And not only that, they were breeding with, um, killing the males and breeding with the females. And um, over time, interestingly, the um, uh, spotted owls stopped hooting to each other. They stopped calling to one another because the barred owl started queuing in on that call and they would use it to find the nest. And um, sadly or interestingly, scientists, the way that they would document habitat, spotted owl habitat, was to go into these areas that had had um, spotted owls in the past and hoot for them. People can become um, expert hooters, or you can also use a um, like a, a whistle sort of thing to, to hoot um, for the owls. Well, the owls had stopped hooting back because they knew that they were going to be targeted by the barred owls. And so it started to be questioned by people who wanted to log the area, whether or not spotted owls were even there anymore. And so Sam ended up bringing him in his teams of dogs and handlers and very, very quickly, the dogs were able to find owl pellets, which are about uh, this big, uh, depending on the species. But um, they're, uh, they're, they are these amazing things that um, owls will throw up. Um, and inside the pellet is um, the bones of the, the, basically things that they can't digest. And so um, that's a common thing that owls do. Um, and so they were there. The spotted owls were there. They were doing their regular, um, you know, life skills, living their lives. Um, and part of that is uh, throwing up these owl pellets. Um, but without the use of the scent detection dogs, that area may or may have been logged because it was not looking like the, the spotted owls were there anymore. And so that's just an example. Another really cool story from conservation canines that, um, that happened up in the Alberta tar sands where there was a move to kill all the wolves in the area because it was thought that the wolves were eating the endangered caribou. And come to find out by doing this uh, large scale carnivore and ungulate study, so hooved animals like caribou and the um, carnivores in the area, um, it was shown uh, the, through the conservation canines collecting all of these samples that as a matter of fact, the wolves were not eating the caribou. Very, very little um, caribou was found in the scat. In fact, they were eating an invasive deer species. And so if that um, study hadn't happened, then um, the wolves would have been extirpated. They would have been killed from the whole area. But the wolves weren't going after the endangered caribou. They were going after an uh, a, a non-native deer. So it's things like that where, you know, you just, there's so many stories like that where if you use dogs, you, again, you're not stressing out the animals whose poop you're trying to collect because you don't need to get anywhere near the animal. Um, and in some cases, like the uh, Alberta tar sound study, they weren't even there at the same season. Um, there's just so many different conservation stories that, that, um, good conservation stories that are coming out of the use of scat dogs. And, and again, conservation canines and Sam Wasser were the, were the leaders in that. And now there are groups all over the world utilizing this, this, um, this you know, dogs as, as uh, conservation partners. And the other thing with conservation canines is, although Eva is what, you know, started out as my companion dog, 99% of the dogs that we get and that were in the, pro have been in the program 30 or more dogs or so over the years, um, most of them are uh, rescued from shelters because they actually don't make great companions until you teach them and give them a job. These dogs tend to be incredibly ball motivated, play motivated. We don't, we don't look for dogs that are food motivated, for example. We look for dogs that would rather play with their toy than eat sort of thing. And so we're saving dogs and putting them to work to save endangered species. And to me, it's like, gosh, you know, you really can't get much better than that. Yeah, so. that's a win-win all the way around. Yeah. 
How long has the research been going on on the island? Uh, with the Southern residents, the pilot year was 2007. Okay. And then uh, that was a very, very short year just to see like what on earth does killer whale poop look like? We had no idea. Um, and so I wasn't part of the program at that point, but um, Sam was and his original first grad student, Catherine Ayers. Um, and then 2008, they did another very short pilot season uh, using the, the scent dog and also coupling that with uh, fluke follows. So going 200 meters or so behind the whales and just kind of checking in the fluke print behind the whales. And then by 2009, the year I came on, we went 100% dog. So that allowed us to stay 400 or more meters behind the whales. And the idea is that you, uh, you watch the direction of the whales and then you uh, figure out which way the wind is coming. And then you position the boat downwind of where that whale swam through so that the air will come across the sample and bring it to the boat. And so if we're able to drive perpendicular to a sample, and as we come in, you know, crossing the, the path of the sample, the dog will have a change of behavior. And that's when we know we can, we turn into the wind. And it's, how, does, how does Eva signal you? Eva uh, tells our, um, she starts, you know, she's just kind of hanging out there and she's really friendly. Um, and she'll, you know, maybe just be gently wagging her tail. And then when she smells a smell, she just gets really stiff and like, and then she starts doing this, like sniffing up the air, I call it. And she'll just, and you can see her nostrils flaring and she'll just gently, you know, barely turn her head because she's trying to hone in on where the sample is. And then as she, as the, as she gets the strongest part of that scent cone, She'll, her head will whip around and then she'll just run to the side of the boat. And it's at that point that I know I need to turn the boat right away. That's amazing. And then she'll start, as we get closer, she'll start licking her lips. She may start whining. Um, and then at that point, we know like whoever's on the front of the boat holding on to the leash, um, uh, I'm having them look in the water around. And usually by the time she's whining, we can actually smell it. And so then, oh it's, really? Yeah. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> the, trick is, um, the trick is not to take your eyes off the dog, though, because she's going to keep working until she finds it. And uh, um, even though we might smell it, our sense of smell is not nearly as fine tuned as a dog's sense of smell. And so we might be like, "Oh, it's here! It's here! It's here!" But actually, it's another fifty or sixty meters away from us. Okay. That's and amazing. I, I bet the question that you're about ready to ask is, what does it smell like, right? Yeah, I was wondering that. I'm guessing a little 50. <laughs> um, it is. It is. It's actually not bad. Um, it smells like slightly bad fish, which it's, it is slightly bad fish. <laughs> you know, like in your refrigerators, just slightly old fish. Um, it's not bad. It's, it's actually... Um, I'll put it this way. I've had people come out on the boat with us, like Islanders. We take volunteers and usually uh, not right now because of COVID, but um, we've taken naturalists or, you know, people that work on whale watch boats or, or um, just community members that are interested in the research. And uh, so many times I've had people like, oh my God, I've been smelling that for years. I had no idea that was whale poop. That's hysterical. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Or like, you know, when you have those moments as an islander when you're out on a boat and you come out between two islands and there's the whales, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Probably O Day whale has been a <laughs> They're not, you know, they're not like a minky whale that uh I don't know if you've ever smelled a minky whale, but minky whales have the the nickname stinky minkies for a good reason. Yeah. Um, that's actually not their poop. That's their breath. It's the, in a baleen. Yeah. Yeah. That well, yeah, it's because of all that stuff stuck in the mouth that the exhalation ends up. Um, but, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? Um, killer whale breath doesn't, you don't really, it doesn't, a, a healthy whale doesn't have bad breath. You know, that a whale is quite ill when they get um when they get stinky breath we we pay attention to stinky breath killer whales 
it's not a good sign when when you can when there's a discernible smell to the breath interesting oh my gosh well this has just been so fascinating and for our youngest watchers today you and i were kind of talking about how mysterious our paths were that led us each to where we are and so for our littlest marine biologists out there what would you suggest for them to do if they're really interested in um, learning more about the orcas? Oh gosh, there's so many different, uh, you know, we're lucky to have the, the internet now um, because everything that you may wanna know about whales is at your fingertips. So I would say um, find a couple of different sites that you like. Um, there uh, um, are my own site that I'm involved with. Wild Orca has some great resources. Um, there are a number of different uh, orca related, killer whale related websites that you can Google and get involved. Uh, my, my broad advice would be to just get your hands on everything you can. Go to the library. Um, here on San Juan Island, we happen to have a pretty darn decent uh, killer whale section and that's everything from primary literature from scientists all the way down to, you know, kids books about, about the whales. And so read everything you can. And, um, you know, again, use the internet, to, uh, plug into other people that are giving talks on the whales, um, get involved, get, get down and, um, help plant, plant trees or, or, um, clean up a, a local beach, things like that, and start make, making friends, meeting people and getting involved in groups that are doing work with, with, with animals that you're interested in. That's the best way is just find your community. Um, and we are really lucky here on San Juan to have a really, really great community of people interested in the whales. And so um, uh, come find us and, uh, and, and learn more and get oh, them. I love that, I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. My absolute pleasure. And so do, um, if you want to find out more about Uba, like we mentioned before, you can go to wildorca.org backslash Uba, E-B-A. And so you can do that. Watch, I'm going to do something fancy here. Are you ready for it? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find out a little bit more about Eva. And thank you, Giles. Thank you for having me. Nice talking with you. You too. And for everyone watching, we just want to say thank you again to the Family Resource Center and to the Community Foundation for funding this episode today. And everybody be well and ears open. Keep listening. Bye-bye.